Your Majesty, thank you. It's an honor to have you here be the keynote speaker at our first Middle East Global Summit. We can think of no one better to kick off this series. Thank you very much. So let me ask, is a true peace process and the two-state solution possible with the current Israeli government in power? How do you approach your dealings with Israel given the hardline rejection so far of any accommodation with the Palestinians? So, yes, I am an optimist, and I, I believe we're actually at a, at a critical crossroads because there's a multitude of issues. Um, so there's two elephants in the room that we always have to, to, to discuss. One is um, um, Palestinian transition and future for a younger generation of leaders. And, and we saw um, uh, Mahmoud Abbas uh, in the past month shaking up um, the, um, uh, the government, um, new blood coming in. Uh, so that's one of the issues that we have to understand where are the Palestinians going. And part of the challenges is we, Jordanians, Arabs, Israelis, Americans, do not know who the younger generation of Palestinians are. And this is very, very important for us to, to be able to reach out to, to these young voices. The other second, or the second elephant in the room is where is Israel going? How can we have an understanding of a, a political horizon is it a one-state solution that you want? Is it a two-state solution? And I'm sure your state solution is different than mine. Mm -hmm. These are the things that are being unplugged. My experience over the past 20 years is, is, is politics doesn't work. Um, the, the opportunities that we have that break down these barriers is what we're talking recently about regional uh, projects. Um, and so how do we invest in each other in such a way where actually your success is my success. That's beginning to, to trigger in people's minds, and this is the new narrative that's out there that gives us hope. The U.S. is pushing ahead, trying uh, to pursue a full peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. There, that initiative has stumbled when it's come to Israel because the current Israeli government has so far re resisted any accommodation dealing with the Palestinians, even though Prime Minister Netanyahu wants peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Do you support this effort? Do you think it's a possibility? Well, we and the Egyptians and, and many others are, are working to make sure that this deal is successful because, again, I think it, it, it brings us through a new horizon. But I think part of the challenges is with the Israeli government, uh, this belief, and by some in the region, that you can parachute over Palestine, um, uh, deal with the Arabs, and work your way back. That does, does not work. And even those countries that have Abrahamic Accords with, with, with Israel, have difficulty moving publicly on those issues when Israelis and Palestinians are dying. So unless we solve this problem, there will never be a true peace. There's something that Saudi Arabia wants, there's something that the Israelis want, there's something what the Americans want. What you have to add to that component is what do the Palestinians get out of it, and actually what does the region get out of it because we're all invested in this together. So it's, it's having that, that ability to look at the slightly bigger picture and not think tactically um, which is what is being talked about now. I hope from now towards the end of the year, uh, we'll tick a lot of these columns that makes everybody happy. And the best deal from my humble experience over my life is when everybody walks away from the table slightly unhappy. Um, and this is what it's going to take, I think, to push us over um, the finish line. Your speech to the UN General Assembly yesterday con say, conveyed a sense of urgency on the subject of refugees. Is the international community not getting the message on refugees? And what more could and should the US and international institutions be doing to assist refugees in Jordan and elsewhere? And why is this crisis being ignored? Well, whenever you have crises around the world, you're going to have um, fatigue. And that does happen to the, the subject of refugees. And, and again, um, we, we are um, slightly thrown off center because of what's happening in Ukraine. So, so people want to look closer to their borders, although uh, this is a problem that's going to come back and, and, and haunt uh, all of us. The international support has dwindled dramatically. We're getting nothing compared to what we as a government are trying to put into support. And in Jordan, um, Syrian refugees have access to our healthcare system, to our education system. They have jobs. They are treated as normal citizens. Um, but we have 20% unemployment. And that can only get worse with the challenges that we have in the region if we have another wave of refugees. And I think people take Jordan for granted for because we're going to do the right thing, we, we don't get the support that we did. Let's turn to the theme of integration in the region, which is the theme of this conference. It's been central to Jordan's region and regional and international policies, which is, Jordan is, of course, not just a buffer, but a bridge in terms to engagement and peaceful cooperation. The Hashemite Kingdom has been at the center of several regional and international projects. You alluded to some of these earlier, between Iraq and Egypt, 
industrial and other partnerships in the Gulf, and, and even the recently announced Mideast India Rail and Transport Corridor. If I could, please, let's start with Egypt and Iraq, and particularly Iraq. This has been, there has been some fantastic progress in terms of co cooperation over the past few years under your leadership. What does this model mean for Jordan? Well, I, you know, again, I think uh, um, the wise uh, counsel of our friends in Egypt to, to really reach out to the Mustafa Al-Qadhabi government then is to create this trilateral uh, relationship is because we could see that the rebuilding of Iraq, including the three countries, but also opening it up to the West um, was so um, uh, important to us. So Baghdad won basically opened the challenge uh, to all of us of how do we get regional projects, water conveyance, energy conveyance, uh, uh, um, railroad infrastructure, logistical bases that all of us can benefit from. Um, and again, with the, the new initiative from, 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 from the Saudis, that only adds uh, to, um, to that, that possibility. You wrote that this 10, 10, 12 years ago, that our last best chance for peace comes at a time of peril. Are we in a time of peril? Is it more perilous now? And how do you see Jordan and the future of the region in five to 10 years? So for the first time, I think we're at the crossroads of opportunity. The economic prosperity potential is I think what breaks down borders. Because at the end of the day, most people will vote for peace if they can put food on the table for their loved ones. Thank you for a great conversation and for joining us today. It meant a Absolutely. lot. Thank you.